Good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the application support webinar for the Freight Innovation Fund Accelerator. My name is Andrea and I'm the Accelerator Program Manager. Just to let you know, we are recording this session and we will share the video and presentation with you in a few days in case you would like to rewatch it or in case that you want to share it with any SME who may be interested in the program. Also, you can always email me or email the Freight Innovation uh, team, and we will, we will be happy to support you with your application. Please feel free to use the Q&A button and ask any questions throughout the presentation that we will get to those at the end. Next slide, please. So let's quickly review the agenda for today. Uh, first, our program founder, the Department for Transport, will provide an overview of the future freight strategy and expectations for this second accelerator. Then our technical lead, Alistair Ritchie, will introduce the Freight Innovation Fund program and explain the difference between the accelerator and the cluster community. I will follow Alistair, providing an overview of our second accelerator program. And then my colleagues, Nick and Alexandra from the service design team will explain the accelerator program challenges. I will finalize the presentation explaining the selection process and application. And then we will have our questions and answers section at the end. So please remember to use the Q&A button to leave all your, all your questions in there. Next slide. Okay, now I'm going to hand over to David Elvi, who is the head of the Future of Freight Plan at the Department for Transport. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us. We've got 45 uh, eager people um, on the call. Um, I'm just going to do 10 minutes uh, to provide a little bit of context. Um, so my name is David Elvi. I lead uh, the uh, Future of Freight team in the Department for Transport. So this is a long-term plan. Um, but we are, perhaps more importantly, the sponsors of the uh, Freight Innovation Fund. Uh, next slide, please. So I just want to give a little bit of context to what you're applying into. I kind of realised that the, re the really nitty gritty stuff of how to get the money uh, is going to come along uh, shortly. But I thought just a little bit of context uh, might sort of might be helpful. So <clears throat> about four years ago now. Um, the National Infrastructure Commission published a report, um, as usual with these things, contain lots of recommendations for government. The hidden away within it uh, were kind of two themes, I suppose. The first was we've got to treat freight uh, as a more important sector than we currently do. So we need to raise its status uh, in our policy making, in our investment decisions. And secondly, we need to stop seeing freight as a series of separate individual modes and start to sort of see it as a as a multimodal system and think about our, our policy in that way. Um, the other thing I think is worth saying is because freight has traditionally been a highly effective, highly efficient um, system operating day to day in the background, delivering all the things that we need. Um, it is fair to say that I think that certainly at the highest levels of government. Um, the freight logistics system of the supply chains that it underpins were not sort of front and center um, of policy making. But we've had a few things hit us over the last two or three years that have kind of changed that quite considerably. Um, obviously, we've had to sort of negotiate and then deliver on new trading relationships following Brexit. Um, we've seen the sort of the, the interruptions uh, that COVID uh, uh, wrought on the global supply chain network and the impact that it had on sort of global freight logistics systems, but including uh, into the UK. Um, and then we kind of got a little indicator of what happens if you don't think about freight and logistics properly. Um, one ship turning sideways in the Suez Canal uh, creates incredible delay and incredible cost uh, to our supply chains. So taking all of that, Back in June last year, the government published a long-term cross-modal plan for freight, which we call, not surprisingly and probably sensibly, uh, the Future of Freight Plan. Um, and within that, we set ourselves five objectives uh, for the freight sector. Um, we want it to be, and it is already many of these things, um, we want to make sure that it either gets better or that it maintains them. Uh, so we want it to be cost efficient, um, reliable and resilient. They're not quite the same thing. It needs to be environmentally sustainable and we set ourselves a task of making it more valued by society so that actually people recognize the role that it plays in their in their day-to-day -day lives okay next slide please 
So within the future of freight, and you see on the right hand side, um, there are five five chapters. Um, these were the areas that sort of a lot of engagement with stakeholders highlighted as the areas where we needed to provide our focus and where we needed to develop um, specific actions to address uh, challenges, opportunities uh, that exist. Um, so our focus today is not on uh, the four in dark green. Uh, that will be for a different audience. It's on um, what we can do around data, technology and innovation. Um, so there's an entire chapter in the plan dedicated to that. If you are so minded, you can go and have a look at it. Um, but essentially, we identified a couple of challenges. So on the first side, the, the freight sector itself, um, it's a relatively established conservative uh, industry, one that operates on pretty tight margins. Um, and that's across all modes. There's been a bit of a spike in uh, shipping line profits uh, over the last sort of, 24 months, but generally speaking, your single digit um, profit margins. And what that creates generally is a relatively conservative approach to innovation, um, and one that tends to focus on incremental improvement of existing systems uh, rather than the consideration of more disruptive uh, technologies. So as a result of that, uh, the sector has limited awareness of the solutions that people on this call have to offer. And I think there's been a mirror image of that, um, which is I think that innovators are perhaps not as familiar as they need to be about not only how the sector operates, but also uh, what its needs are. And so what that kind of comes together as is an incomplete understanding amongst both industry and government um, of what the technology that you're providing uh, can, can make to um, the freight system. So we just we developed a strategic goal, and this is where we sort of start to feed into nicely uh, this program. Um, we want to focus on the commercialization of late stage uh, freight solutions, um, particularly, um, and we give a nice little list uh, below um of the areas where we're particularly interested in and you will hear a lot more uh from alistair and from andrea about the challenges for this year um but we are we what we have within the department uh another program the transport um uh, trig we call it um which focuses on very early stage um uh technology development uh, providing small grants for trials. Uh, the Freight Innovation Fund provides then uh, the TRL level five plus. So we're trying to create this uh, full spectrum. And it's possible that some people on this call are alumni from our TRIG program. Um, and we obviously are very pleased when that, when that happens. So I'm not gonna go into detail of what we want from you. That will come in the next couple of sections. But just quickly onto the next slide, please. This is our reflection. Um, on the first year of Freight Innovation Fund. Um, we had to work with CPC and they had to do a very rapid job to get it out of the door by the end of financial year back in March. Um, and perhaps we hadn't put as much uh, careful thought, consideration and strategy um, into the design of the program as we might have done had we had a bit more time. But nevertheless, um, and this is not just coming from me, this is not just my personal reflections. Uh, if you look down the right-hand side, you'll see a man in, a, in an e-cargo bike. That man is, is, is my minister. Uh, so it's the minister who sponsors this program. Um, and that is him uh, about two weeks ago, having a great time at the demonstration day uh, for the first, cohort, first year's cohort. And what you see here are a couple of other bits and pieces, some very good media. Um, that's always a good thing from a government perspective. Um, one of our um, alumni uh, getting a lot of coverage on the BBC for uh, its partnership with the post office, delivering by drone uh, mail between the North, Northern Scotland and the Orkneys. And then in the middle there, you may not have heard of RoboK. I think that may change in the future. Um, but they are another one of our alumni. Um, and they've raised an additional $2.1 million. So just dollars, not sterling, but still nevertheless significant. Um, and I've done so largely off the back of the success of the trial that this program funded. So I imagine RoboK is the dream for a large number of people on this call. Um, so the message from this screen is not only am I pleased with how it's going um, and that this program has demonstrated that it does work, um, but that people far more senior than me in the organization um, are also uh, very content with how it's going. 
Okay, then sort of the final slide, please. So I suppose this is fairly obvious, really. Um, I'm very excited to uh, receive applications from those on this call and hopefully potentially from some others. Um, and I'm fascinated to see uh, the solutions um, that you've developed and how we can apply them um, to achieving our objectives uh, to the freight, freight system, um, all modes, as I've said many times. Um, and I guess it's really clear that we, we want you to succeed. You know, your success is our success in this context. Um, if we have more robo-Ks coming through this program, we not only uh, address some of the issues and challenges facing the freight sector, but we also deliver upon some of the government's more strategic objectives around um, productivity growth, levelling up the economy, um, achieving net zero, and so on. So please uh, listen to the rest of this webinar. It will provide you with all the details I think that you, that you need uh, to apply. I will be hanging on and coming back at the end for some Q&A. Um, but otherwise, I think I will hand over uh, to Alistair, who's going to take us through the next, the next set of slides. So thank you very much for listening. Um, if you have any questions, uh, please uh, pop them in the Q&A if you can, not the chat. Thanks very much. Good morning. Uh, thank you very much, David. It's very informative. Uh, and it's really great from our point of view, the amount of support we've got from the Department of Transport over the last year or so. Uh, as uh, David said, my name's Alistair. I'm Head of SME Development at Connect Basic Catapult, and I am the technical lead for this programme. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, what I'd like to do first of all, for those that don't know uh, a lot about us, is to explain what the Catapult Network is and who we as CPC are, Connected Places Catapult. So the Catapult Network is a network of nine technology and innovation centres which uh, cross the UK, and they focus on the technologies that we want to develop as a country uh, going into the future. So we have, for example, the Medical Discovery Catapult, which focuses on vaccine manufacture and uh, development. Uh, we have the High Value Manufacturing Catapult, which focuses more on engineering problems. Here at Connected Places Catapult, we are the UK's innovation accelerator for transport, smart cities and place leadership. And that place leadership bit is important because that's where we help local authorities, universities, um, government, in order to be able to bring the technology of transport and smart cities into the places where we actually need them and providing that leadership as to how those places can actually use those technologies. Next slide, please. So onto the Freight Innovation Fund. Uh, Freight Innovation Fund, as David said, is part of the uh, freight strategy of the government. It aims to establish uh, a long-term vision for the UK freight, freight sector and how we can bring uh, different, the, the very complex different sectors of the uh, freight sector together in order to drive uh, innovation, development of new products and services, and uh, commercialization of those products and services to bring success both to the freight sector, but also to the UK as a whole. Freight Innovation is, made, is a £7 million programme and it has two major components, one of which is the Freight Innovation Cluster, which runs throughout uh, the program um, and currently has 255 uh, members within it. We aim to help to upskill the sector as a whole and also to find new opportunities, bring in investment um, and to make the sector more attractive um, from a commercial point of view. It runs alongside the Accelerator Program, which Andrea will tell you about more very shortly. But that Accelerator Program aims to have three cohorts of 10 SMEs, which will run up until March 2025. We are coming to the close of our first. And of course, this webinar is about uh, introducing you to the second cohort. Next slide, please. So the Freight Innovation Cluster, it is a robust network of members. As I said, it has 255 organisations at all different levels of the uh, sector. We have industry, academia, local authority, um, large international um, players, um, 
And so it's aimed to bring together all stages of innovation that can benefit the freight sector and also to help those earlier in the uh, development journey to be able to access um, the larger players, the contracts, the investment that they need to bring that innovation into the sector. It's proven to be a very uh, popular community. It is very enthusiastically supported and I would encourage all of you to join uh, our freight innovation cluster for the benefits that it can bring to you. Next slide, please. Um, so the primary things that we are doing within uh, the cluster is engagement to try and bring together all the different levels of the sector. Um, as I said, um, from industry to early startups to local authorities, importantly to bring on board decision makers and those who want to make a difference. Uh, also encouraging diversity, which is a key part of um, what, what we are trying to do within um, the cluster. We attempt to, uh, and we are in fact, driving matchmaking across the cluster. So uh, we have a, a cluster manager, Francesca, who is more than happy both to find out more about what you do, but also to facilitate uh, introductions uh, to those people who are going to help make you a success. And as David said uh, early in his presentation, uh, your success is very much our success. We are very keen for you to succeed in this program. Um, as a catapult, we are a non-for-profit organization. So actually your success is very much our success. Uh, we are also looking to upskill the um, sector, looking at things like access to AI and cybersecurity and new technologies that are coming on in the future. But a key part of what we do is delivering those tangibles. So we want to see new products and services, new businesses in the market, and we want to see them growing through uh, investment, through their ability to internationalize, and in general to support the UK economy because the freight sector is a huge part of the, uh, the UK economy and its success will support uh, the wider um, uh, economy that we all are part of. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, I think that was uh, the end of what I wanted to say. And I'd like to pass back over to Andrea, who's going to tell you more specifically about the accelerator. Thank you. Thanks, Alistair. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, just to provide you some context about the accelerator, as David and uh, Alistair mentioned, we already uh, selected the first cohort that is about to finalize. Uh, so we launched the whole program in January. We selected this cohort in April. Uh, and while well, we had the demo day now in, in, in October. So we have gathered a couple of statistics that we wanted to show you today. So for the first cohort, we got 65 applications. Uh, we selected nine SMEs, each of them successfully conducted the trials with the industry partners. Uh, well, actually, David mentioned a couple of, of stories that we have about the program. Um, and also with the slides of the webinar, we are going to share the brochure of the first cohorts in case that you want to read more about them. Uh, we made around 30 investor introductions, and thanks to the investment support provided to the SMEs through the program, they have successfully raised seven million of pounds to date, and we still are working with a couple of other SMEs that have a, the round, a funding round open. Uh, we made around 75 business introductions, and the program has created 22 new job positions. Uh, and well, here you can find a picture of our SMEs uh, with their team. So next slide, please. Okay, so now we'll launch our second open call on October 19, and we are looking to select up to 10 SMEs with a technology readiness level five or above. So this means company with the technology validated in an operational environment and with at least a large scale prototype. You can find the list of the TRL levels on our website and the description of each of them in case that you would like to read about it. Uh, and each successful SME we have the opportunity to access to up to 150k of grant funding uh, for conducted trials with the uh, industry partners. And the amount of this grant will be based on the proposal that we receive in the application. 
The program will last six months and the SME will have the opportunity to test their solutions in real world environments and they will have access to test applications provided by our program partners. Uh, also to be eligible to apply for the program, SMEs must address at least one of the program challenges that we have and that we're going to explain in a bit. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, okay, funding, as I just mentioned, uh, the FT will provide up to 150K in grant funding. Uh, the specific amount will be determined based on the trial proposal. And to foster a collaborative and mutually beneficial partnerships, SMEs are expected to contribute 30% uh, of the total project cost as matching funds. So this was designed to be in kind, and it could include, for example, an equipment that you already possess and intend to use for the trial, or perhaps a training required for your employees as part of the testing. So if you go to our website, you will find this funding section that we have in the short video here, uh, and you can find all the details and uh, a list with all the eligible costs that you can include in there. Uh, you just have to press the more info button. Uh, and just to provide an example of the amounts, uh, if you have been awarded with a grant of 100K, you should match it with 30% of the total project. So that will be 30K, resulting in a to total trial cost of 130. Uh, you will be able to sp specify these details in the cost breakdown section in the application form. Uh, and in terms of the payment structure, it will be 60% upfront in March when the program starts and 40% at the end upon the conclusion of the trials and submission of the final report. Next slide, please. So we have six amazing industry partners this year that will support and provide the access to the testing facilities. Uh, so the program partners are Freightliner, FedEx Express, Port of Tyne, Winnicanton, Maritime Transport, and Permouth International Port. So to gain a deeper understanding of our partners and their role within the accelerator, we request you to explore our website. So there you will find a detailed partner profiles highlighting the specific challenges they're keen on, the facilities and resources uh, that they can provide to the SMEs, their motivations for participating in the accelerator, and additional relevant information that you can use for your application. So please download the partner profiles before completing completing your applications. Uh, also, the SMEs have two options to apply to the program. Uh, so the first one is with a trial proposal, looking for a match with one of our amazing program partners, or uh, the SMEs can also apply with their own trial partner. So this could be any freight organization that you are maybe already having discussions with. So in case that you select the second option, you have to provide more information about this organization, uh, the relationship that you have with them. And also these partners have to come to the um, interviews that we are going to have in the selection process. Next slide, please. Okay, SME offering. So in addition to offering the financial support and the chance to test your product, our commitment stands to support our cohort in scaling their businesses by providing customized business support. So at the beginning of the program, we will run one-on-one -on -one sessions to explore specific needs, your needs and identify the support and business development opportunities that we can provide you uh, during the program. So this includes marketing and investment support with experienced coaches coaches where you will have the opportunity to review your company strategy or any challenges that you could have in that area through one-on-one -on -one sessions with these coaches. It also includes introductions to potential customers or any other um, support that we believe from the catapult that can help you and we identify in the needs assessment. Uh, also in the program, we will provide trial support to help you design and implement your trial and also to make sure that we are delivering everything on time. And we will culminate the program with a demonstration date. This is a celebratory event where the SMEs will be able to showcase their solutions and demonstrate what they have achieved during the program and, and the trials to key stakeholders that we invite, invite to the event, this event. So this could be investors, potential clients, academia, government, and anyone that we believe could be relevant to come and meet the SMEs. 
Next slide, please. Okay, well, now I'm going to hand over to Nick Talbot and Alessandra, who are going to explain the program challenges. Good morning, everyone. My name's Nick Talbot. I'm a service design lead at Connected Places Catapult. Uh, and thank you, Andrea. As uh, mentioned, we'll be walking you through the challenges, but also a little bit of background so you understand where they're coming from and a little bit about how they differ from year one. Next slide, please. So I'll be kicking us off with the introduction and background, so specifically a bit about strategic direction and the hardware technology innovation requirement. Then I'll hand over to my colleague, Alessandra, who's also been working on the challenge development um, uh, to walk through the research and methodology. And then we'll go through the four challenges, some descriptions and some examples to help you understand how to address those challenges. Next slide. So I think the key parts of the strategic direction, David already uh, gave a good overview previously, but just to reiterate, intermodality is at the heart of all of the challenges. Uh, there is that hardware technology requirement, which we're kind of increasing the importance of this year, and everything must be scalable. So that TRL level five plus with the potential to scale, not just niche innovations for one-off customers. Um, and then as for the future of freight plan, the five vision statements are really important. So they're kind of our North Star challenges, which try to achieve cost efficiency, reliability, resilience, environmental sustainability, and uh, value by society. Next slide, please. So just quickly on that point about hardware technology, um, previously in fifth year one, we accepted uh, digital only data only types of solutions and platforms. This year, there must be an innovative hardware technology component. Um, there can be data and digital aspects, but there must be that hardware technology component as well. Um, and that means, uh, for example, uh, it could be existing hardware used in a new way or entirely new hardware. Um, and as mentioned at the bottom there, enabling technologies, complementary technologies, all of that kind of language and thinking is really great if you have an understanding there of how hardware enables those data and digital activities. Next slide. Ooh, Alessandra, would you like to walk through the research and engagement approach? No, thank you, Nick. I'm Alessandra. I'm also a service designer at the Connected Places Catapult. So before introducing indigenous challenges, I'm going to walk you through our research and methodology. So first of all, we analyze and review last year's uh, methodology, as well as feedback received from our SMEs and partners. Uh, we undertook some desk research to find the latest data so to support our findings. And we also had both internal as well as external interviews with a broad range of stakeholders. So from those interviews, we defined opportunity errors uh, that we presented and validated during an industry workshop with six members of the cluster. And finally, we led some co-design sessions with our partners to make sure that the final challenge statements also suit their needs and goals. Next slide, please. So I'm going to walk in, going to talk about this year's challenges. Um, so as Nick mentioned, we have four di different challenges, and for each of them, we'll present the challenge statements and in-depth challenge description, and also some examples uh, of solutions coming from our partner and industry. I'm going to talk to you about the statement and description for each of them, and then Nick will talk about the examples. Uh, so for challenge one, we're looking for improvements and adaptation to plan vehicles and large equipment that is currently used in loading, unloading and movement around a depot or interchange. Uh, next slide, please. Um, as heavy machinery is highly impactful in terms of the environment, efficiency, as well as health and safety, we welcome innovation and new solutions in many areas. So in particular, we believe that it's key to minimize fuel consumption and emissions, but also improve time and cost efficiency in all movements um, and areas of, um, of interchanges and depot spaces, um, as, well, as well as increasing accuracy through automation and computer assistance. Um, innovations um, affecting the most commonly used mas machinery or the most essential machinery to enable travel modes will be given priority as well. Next slide, please. So I think the key aspect here is that connection between those uh, vision goals of environmental cost resilience and social coming through. Um, we particularly found that there's very high amounts of diesel fuel consumption in many of these interchanges uh, and freight modes. Uh, typically in one UK port, there's up to 400 uh, diesel consuming vehicles active or idling at any one time. Um, so there's huge demand out there across modes uh, and 
uh, operators. I think also it's important to note that the handling of goods, especially construction freight, uh, large machinery is perhaps poorly adapted to uh, moving that type of freight in particular. Um, and improvements to depot movement and rail freight loading vehicle speed and efficiency. Here we saw that between 15 to 45 pounds could be added per container because of inefficiency to transferring it from a maritime stack to a rail terminal, for example. Improvements to cranes, straddle carriers, and reach stackers' speed, accuracy, and consistency of output. We've already seen automated support approaches here be effective. We'd like to see more uh, and more efficient ones as well. And reduction or elimination of accidents and damages through new technologies or automation. Uh, again, a great social benefit there, as well as many other benefits. Next slide. Um, challenge two looks at new improved uh, types of container containment solutions, container adaptation, and associated equipment to optimize loads and brokerage, as well as improve site management. Next slide, please. So for this challenge, we're looking for any type of container and containment solutions, such as tote brokes, boxes, uh, roll cages, or any other similar forms of systems in which freight is grouped and processed. Um, those solutions need to be able to use uh, to be used efficiently for a variety of transfer modes, and they also need to be able to improve loading and unloading times and efficiency, as well as optimize capacity utilization and brokerage. And we're also encouraging supporting technologies or reductions in terms of emission costs, risk of fire, damage, waste, and so on. Um, for this particular challenge, next slide, please. Yep. So this challenge is kind of a, a two part challenge. One aspect is looking at the wide range of containment solutions, not just containers, ISO containers, but the whole range of containment solutions. And the other part is looking at those supporting technologies. So things like cameras or sensors uh, that track entry and exit to depots or movements around outdoor depots. Uh, you can see a whole range of uh, aspects here, whether it's the loading uh, aspects or capacity aspects of containment, um, the safety of them, uh, all valuable for multiple of the vision and goals. Um, and then again, as I say, ID recording and tracking solutions. We found that currently there's an existing market about 90% accuracy, but that still means we need a manual uh, task force to carry out the same activity because that accuracy isn't high enough. So we are looking for very high levels of accuracy when it comes comes to that recording and tracking type uh, solutions. Uh, challenge three is looking at sustainable and responsive solutions to lack of intermodal interchanges, demand of short term interchanges and need to expand existing depots. Next slide, please. Um, so for this challenge in particular, we're looking for innovations that support the design and creation of temporary and or movable interchange depots. And in particular, uh, it's important to identify equipment or adaptations that can bridge the gap between permanent depots and current short term solutions that are currently inefficient. And innovations also need to be cost effective by improving uh, efficiency, by having the ability to spread the cost the more you use them, uh, or also by the ability to unlock locations that are currently uh, not being utilised at the moment. Next slide. I think with this challenge, uh, it may be new to many other people in the audience. I think that the reason for that is because there is actually quite a lot of demand from uh, including our partners, of course, uh, listed previously, for support in sites, particularly construction sites, which are a bit off grid and away from existing transport connections. Um, the difficulty in identifying this challenge is that those needs uh, are quite cyclical, they can come and go, um, and it's it's maybe not a consistent form of demand in one type. Um, and maybe that's why the market hasn't quite realized there is this big de demand where people are turning down work uh, or unable to win the work because they can't meet that level of efficiency in those off-grid sites. So anything that is uh, an improvement upon yellow machinery and those other typical short-term approaches, uh, but not as capital expensive as say the full uh, kind of conveyor belts, hoppers, et cetera, et cetera, you might have in a permanent depot. Um, and anything that can be responsive, movable, uh, support big peaks and troughs, or even expand existing depot areas. The one quick thing I'll say here is that 
this challenge is working within the existing planning regulation. So things like meeting noise, uh, dust, operation hours, et cetera, et cetera. Anything that supports that is really welcome. Uh, finally, challenge four looks at unlocking the potential of new and or existing micromobility and new mobility modes or interchanges. Next slide. Um, as we look at, as we're now um, about to face significant advances and changes to electric batteries, powertrains, and engines, we're, we'll also uh, see does innovations unlock the ability to carry larger loads, travel farther, and be more reliable. And this, of course, creates a great opportunity to adapt or improve existing e-mobility and micro-mobility vehicles, but also design new ways of transportation um, um, and new ways of transporting freight that can significantly lower carbon emissions, traffic, um, and optimize last mile logistics. And those innovations also have the possibility to open new intermodal connections, uh, which require less capital investment as well. Next slide. So this year, we really want to open up uh, that idea around e-mobility and micro-mobility. As we said, those technological advancements means that potentially heavier loads can be carried for greater distances. That means we expect new types of uh, mobility, maybe adaptations from old types uh, or entirely new types. Um, and hopefully they have that increased ability, which maybe unlocks new uses or supporting technologies. Um, I think it's important here to talk about uh, light touch interchanges. What does that mean? Well, it means that we think that micro mobility and e-mobility can be that kind of lifeblood that connects maybe the larger, uh, more regulated spaces where space is limited. So a maritime port, space is very limited. Could micro mobility and e-mobility have a lighter touch interchange with that than say a rail connection could with the maritime port? Uh, and it applies to all modes, uh, of course, uh, but one example there. And of course, this idea that urban areas and rural areas could benefit from e-mobility and micro mobility, perhaps being smaller, more agile, uh, more cost efficient, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so just a reminder um, that that information can be found online uh, as a downloadable PDF as well. And we're happy to answer your questions at the end of the session. Back to Andrea. Great, thank you, Nick. Um, next slide, please. Okay, application. Uh, the first thing that you need to know is that applications will close on November the 26th. So we encourage you to, to submit your application early. So in case that you have any questions, we can actually assist you. Um, also here you can find the eligibility criteria, which is also available on the website. Uh, please ensure that you meet this criteria before proceeding with your application to the program. So first you must be an SME. Uh, you must address at least one of the program challenges. Uh, you must have the technology readiness level five or above. Uh, you must have a UK registered company and we won't be able to proceed with those SMEs that are not registered in the UK. Uh, you must be willing to test in our real world environment and obviously having commitment and willingness to engage with the program and get the most out of it. So we have a how to apply section on the website, uh, which contains four essential supporting documents that we strongly recommend you to review before applying. So these documents include an application guidance with all the detail for all the questions in the form, uh, the terms and conditions of the program, uh, the partner's profile that I previously mentioned, and a detailed document providing additional information about the challenges. So as you can notice on the website, we provided a condensed version of the challenges, but you can access to the full explanation on this document that we have here. Uh, also in your application, you will be required to submit a trial proposal with the associated cost and details. So this proposal is going to be key in helping us assess the feasibility of the trials with our program partners. So please try to use a simple language that everyone can understand, uh, even those who don't have a technical background. Next slide, please. Okay, as you know, we launched the open call on October 19, and the deadline again is November 26. 
uh, Connected Places Catapultin will review all the applications, score them, and shortlist 20 SMEs that will be contacted by December 15th. So if you are shortlisted, we will share with you all the details of the selection process, but it basically consists of two interviews. So the first one is the technical and business due diligence. This is a 30 minutes meeting uh, with uh, technical and industry experts from Connected Places Catapult. So this interview will be around the innovation of your technology, the feasibility and details of the trial, the impact uh, your solution could have uh, on the sector and the sustainability. Uh, so we basically are going to analyze your proposal from a technical point of view. So I recommend you to bring uh, your CTO or, or someone in your team with technical experience. Uh, these interviews are going to take place early January. Uh, and the SMEs that progress from this stage will attend to a commercial interview where they will be assessed by our program partners and DFT. Uh, this is a 30 minutes meeting uh, where they will have to 10 minutes to make a presentation and then it will be followed by 20 minutes of questions. And uh, this interview will be focused on the business model, how you can work with the partners and uh, what benefits uh, your trial can bring to the sector, et cetera. And these interviews will take place at the end of January or beginning of February. But if you're shortlisted, I will send you an individual invitation with all the details to join both sessions and they're going to be virtual. Then uh, during February, we will run all our admin process to sign the grant document letters with those SMEs that were selected. And the accelerator is set to kick off in March. So during the first week, we will host a welcome day at our London office. This in-person event is designed to onboard the SMEs and partners, providing a comprehensive overview of the program's structure, expectations, and any other key details that you need to know to start the program. And as I previously mentioned, the program will last six months. So the first two months will be dedicated to the trial design with your partners. And then the trial live will be from May to August, 2024. And the demo day will be in September. The date is to be confirmed. Next slide, please. Okay, last but not least, this is the scoring criteria that we will use to evaluate your applications. So we have six criteria and here you can see the weight that will carry each of them. So the first one is the solution where we want to understand if the product is innovative with a clear unique selling proposition and the development stage of the solution. Uh, the criteria number two is the test bed proposal. So once again, uh, the use case that you put in the proposal must address one of the program challenges. We want to see a clear description of the trial, timeline, cost breakdown, and what you are expecting to achieve during the, the program uh, and how you're going to engage with the partners as well. So please make sure to be concise, uh, but provide as many details as necessary. And again, please try to use a very simple language. At uh, testbed feasibility, we want to understand if this proposal is feasible within the time frame, level of resources, budget, and the maturity of your solution. Uh, impact, uh, here we will evaluate the short and long-term impact of the trial in the sector uh, and the benefits that this could bring if we adopt that technology. A uh, team, well, here we are looking for applicants to demonstrate that their team has the necessary skills, knowledge, a background to deliver the trial. So rather than just listing out the team members' names in the application, I would recommend you to tell us a bit more about them and what they bring to the table. And finally, the traction. Here we want to know if the products satisfy the market, if you already have any traction, and if you have a sustainable growth plan. So for those SMEs that don't have an established client yet, we recommend you highlight your growth plan if you're in discussions with potential clients and any notable awards or grants that you may have secured. So I hope this was clear enough to all of you. Uh, but well, now uh, we 
are going to start the Q&A section. So if you have any questions, please put it in the Q&A box. I have a couple of questions here. So uh, I will ask all the panelists to please turn on your camera so we can start. Right, we are all here. Perfect. So, okay, the first question is, can you please send the slides afterwards? Yes, <laughs> that was a simple one. Um, who should we contact for matchmaking? I think this is related to the cluster, Alistair. Yes, so uh, if you're not already a member of the cluster, if you could join, you'll find the link on our uh, website. Um, if you search in there for Freight Innovation Cluster, you'll find it. Uh, and then Francesca within the cluster will be able to talk to you about what's, what's possible. Thank you. And if you have like any specific questions about the cluster per se, uh, you can send us an email in the address that we have here, freightinnovationfund at cpc.catapult.org.uk. <laughs> but well, you can send us an email here. Uh, the next question is, are the funding amounts inclusive or exclusive of VAT? I think the answer is exclusive of VAT, but Alistair, if you have anything to add here? Yeah, uh, absolutely. So grant funding uh, is uh, a gift effectively to you. There's a limit to how much grant funding you can have within any given year, but it is VAT exempt. Okay. Thank you. Uh, can project funds be used to fabricate technology for trials or can they only be used to operate existing equipment? So, uh, yeah, we would like you to test solutions that are already developed. We understand that during the trial, maybe you have to adapt your solution to the partner and you have to do a couple of developments. So that's OK, but the solution needs to be fully developed to test uh, in the program. If, I don't know if any of the panelists have anything to add. I think that's no. Okay. Uh, are we allowed to enter two applications, one for challenge two and another for challenge four? Yep, you can apply for both challenges. Uh, you just have to explain the difference in the application. Uh, I The first part of the application is more about your solution. And the second part is about your trial and the proposal. So if you're submitting two applications, you can just copy exactly the same information about your solution. And then you can specify the differences in the trial proposal. Uh, will the slides be email out? Yep. We will send this to you probably tomorrow with the recording of the webinar. Um, okay, CPC demonstration partners before. Do we need to li liaise with CPC demonstration partners before applying for the grant or is it suitable for partners needs assessment as part of the application process? So if you need any specific information about the partners, I will recommend you to go through the partner profile if you still have more questions, you can just email us and we can try to answer this the best that we can. We can set up a call and talk about it, uh, but we are not having needs assessments uh, during the selection process. This is something that we do once we start the program to understand what type of business support we can provide to the SME. If any of the panelists would like to add something to these answers, they are free to unmute. Yourself and talk. <laughs> okay. Um charge for the support is need to be built into a grant. If we are already in touch with okay, if we are already in touch with one of the program partners, can we indicate them as a test partner? Yeah, actually, if you are already in contact with them, I think um it's a good opportunity to you to, to submit a, a must customize a proposal. This doesn't mean that the SMEs that are not in touch with the partner uh, when we consider is like it's exactly the same. So yeah, it's okay for you to mention that you're in contact with this partner and 
and mention the partner. Yep. Alistair, you wanted to say something. No, no, <laughs> uh, I think you might have missed one from Steve Carroll, though. Uh, where? Question. So did we ask the question on uh, do CPC got demonstration sites charged for their support to the building into the grant? Uh, well, uh, no, partners are not going to charge you to provide these testbed facilities. Uh, this is all part of the program and the grant is going to be used for the SME cost. So basically the solution, the, the testbed facilities uh, are included in the program and you don't have to pay for it. I think that's the short answer. Okay. Uh, are there any limitations to applying to TRIC and FIF simultaneously with the same project? For example, applying to TRIC for the commercial model development and FIF for the scaling of hardware with an industry client as the test bed. So I think probably Alistair can answer this question better than me. Yes. So there are some limitations in terms of the amount of grant funding you can have over a certain period of time. So that, that needs to be borne in mind. Uh, but on a technical side, we will look carefully at applications that might cross over. So you can apply for TRIG and for Freight Innovation at the same time. However, we will put particular uh, take a very close look at those projects to make sure that we're not double funding in any in any place and uh, uh, and that they align with the um, strategic priorities of the programs. Great, thank you, Alisa. Uh, is there a chance to talk about an idea with someone from CPC without any commitment ahead of an application? Yeah, of course. We're open to have calls with anyone that contact us, just send us an email to this uh, direction that we have here and we can have a chat without any commitment. Um, can an applicant use their own subcontractor to assist in the trial design and evaluation support or must the CPC do this? So um, yeah, the applicant can use their own subcontractor to assist in the design and evaluation, but CPC needs to be involved. So basically you have to, I mean, we're going to uh, provide you like a workshop explaining what we want to see on the trial proposals, partners and SME are coming to this, and then we are going to ask you to send that proposal to us. We have to review it and approve it so you can go ahead and start the trial. Uh, the partner is going to help us to review the proposal as well. But yeah, if you want to involve any subcontractors, please feel free to do it. You just have to clearly explain the roles uh, in the application. Okay, is the grant part of the minimis? Uh, sure what could, is that? I can answer that one. And yes, when I was saying that you need to be careful about the amount of grant funding you have within a particular time period, de minimis is exactly what I was referring to. So yes. Okay. Uh, scope. Okay, can someone from the program help assess our fit within scope before making the application? How strict are the challenge areas? So these are two questions. The first question is like, yeah, we can have a call. We can uh, assist you. What we can't do is to review the application before submitting, because this is going to give you an advantage uh, in front of the rest of the SMEs. But yeah, we can support you. We can have a call and understand if you actually fit uh, with the program. And then how strict are the challenge areas? So I think maybe Nick or Alexandra can answer this question? Um, I guess the general thing is, if there's any doubt, then apply. As long as you meet those criteria um, from uh, Andrea and Alistair through any conversations about funding or, or program fit, as long as you fit that and you think that you have an innovation that meets the challenges, I'd say go for it. Um, we've clearly changed our approach from year two to year one to increase the number of examples we've given so that it's clearer exactly what kind of innovations we're looking for. Um, but at the same time, we are relatively 
relatively open to understanding that the wording we use might not match uh, what everybody else uses. And so there might be forms of innovation that we can't put a word to, but relate to those kinds of challenges we've listed. So I'd say, yeah, as long as you pass those first couple of checks uh, that, and you think you are applicable to a challenge area, then go for it. And I would also add to that is that the whole idea of innovation is it's new ideas. So we don't necessarily know what they will be. Also, your solutions might be moving from one sector to another, and we might not be able to describe it within the challenges. Um, so I think in answer to you, will it be strictly applied? No, but you do have to fit within a certain, you know, relevance, certainly. Thank you both. Uh, if we are a UK registered company, but a subsidiary of a foreign company, are we eligible? Are there any particular requirements to the UK company? So yeah, maybe your subsidiary can be based in other country, that's not an issue. What we want to make sure is that you have the company registering here in the UK, that you are having operations here, that you have a bank account here in the UK, so I think those are the yeah criteria that you have to follow to apply. But Vitaly, please feel free to send me an email and we can have a chat about it later. Thank you. Uh, are innovations decarbonizing transport refrigeration in scope? I think Nick, maybe you can help me with that one. I guess as long as the technology is related to containment, and that to me sounds like a, a form of containment that would affect cost, um, the yield of goods, the environmental costs. So it's it's working to those visions. It's related to containment. Uh, I think it's pretty relevant. I think, Alessandra, you came across uh, food and drinks containment issues as well. Yeah, I think it was also related a little bit to Challenge 4 as well, but that will have to be about micro mobility and e-mobility. But yeah, definitely, if it involves containment uh, solutions, then it's Challenge 2. Thank you. I have a question in the chat. So it's it mentioned 150K, but the example is state 100, 100K plus 30K match funding. What's the maximum ground and maximum match funding? So yeah, it was just a simple example that anyone could understand, uh, but the maximum amount that you can ask for the ground is a 150. And the maximum match funding, I think that depends on you. What we are requesting in the program is 30% of the total project cost. But if you consider that you need to put more in the match funding because the, the trial is going to require more funds, it, that's okay for us. We don't have a maximum. So uh, if you explain that on the application, that should be fine for us. Um. Okay, if I understand things correctly, the funding is to run the trial or to enhance the technology prior the, to the trial. So yeah, the funding is to run the trial. You should have your product fully developed uh, to be selected. What I mentioned in one of the answers is like, if you need to do any development to uh, to to adjust your uh, product to the partner, that's okay. You could include that as part of the proposal, but again, your solution needs to be fully developed. Then I think this question is for you, Alistair. Uh, how can it be a new a new idea if it is at least TRL five? <laughs> because I think you mentioned something about it. Uh, I wouldn't say new idea, but it might be a new a new application of something. For example, moving between sectors, a new way of looking at things, uh, a new innovation. Perhaps new idea is the wrong way of saying it. A new innovation for the freight sector, which might not in itself be a new idea as such. If that answers the question. 
Thank you. Yeah, Andrea, just quickly on that, I think we see a lot of innovation in the road space and that same innovation could be applied in a in the same or a very similar way in numerous other modes. Um, so that's a perfect example where something might be quite a late st stage TRL in road, but it might be innovative to air, uh, maritime, rail, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. And just the last question, I, I know we need to wrap up. <laughs> uh, does an applicant need to be seeking investment to grow to be eligible? The answer is no. I mean, if you are planning to raise capital, uh, you can receive the support from our investment team, but it's not something, it, it, it's not necessary. It's not one of the criteria to be selected. Uh, okay, well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining the webinar, for making all your questions. We are going to share the recording and the slides uh, probably tomorrow. And again, if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me through Freight Innovation Fund uh, email address. So thank you, everyone. Have a nice day.